Let's now move to the mathematical preliminaries for our course. They are listed here and involves a kind of overview from something that some of you will already be familiar with. They are an introduction to the delta function proposed by the physicist Dirac, the concept of convolution integral, the sampling of a function, the differential equations, and finally, the numerical solutions to these differential equations. Let's start with the delta function. Like the exponential functions or the logarithm or the sine and cosine, the delta function is a function that I would like to introduce to you in this way that I'm going to show to you its property and its graph. It is, however, a special function, and you will understand in a moment why. And it is being proposed by uh, Dirac, Paul Dirac, who is uh, considered by many a genius of physics. And it's extremely relevant for the, uh, for the forthcoming of our course. This is the graph of this function. And you immediately see that, well, uh, there are some symbols and some um, uh, style of plotting which is not familiar with what you have been exposed to. This function seems to be everywhere zero, so it's pretty boring, with the exception of just one single point, x equals to zero, where the function is somehow replaced, the value of the function is somehow replaced by this arrow. This means that the function at that point takes an infinite amplitude, take an infinite value. So, you know, usual functions like exponential, straight lines, etc., they do not show this kind of strange behavior. Let me show you a way how to better understand how the delta function is coming to life. And allow me to make a digression and introduce another function that I will call uh, the rectangle function. Let me call it P of T. And here I'm using T as independent variable. I told you already these are names, names of variables like containers and buckets are interchangeable. And this function is defined like follows and like the graph shows. Whenever the argument, the independent variable, is uh, smaller than a given parameter epsilon, known, the function is taking a constant value, 1 divided by 2 times epsilon. However, outside of this range, whenever the independent variable is larger than epsilon in absolute terms, the value of the function is zero everywhere else. And you actually see here what it means. There is an interval between minus epsilon to plus epsilon, I assume that epsilon is positive, where the function is piecewise constant. So, and the value that it takes is one divided by two uh, times epsilon. And everywhere else is zero. Now, one interesting properties which is immediate to verify is that the area below this function is just one because it's the area of this rectangle after all. Everywhere else the function is zero, so if the interval of integration spans from minus infinity to plus infinity, the area is contributed only in this range where the function is non-zero. Base times height result in one. So the area below this function or the integral between minus infinity to plus infinity is one. It turns out that if you change the value of epsilon, if you make epsilon smaller, the amplitude that is defined like the inverse of epsilon is getting very, very big. In the limit of epsilon being very small, infinitesimally small, the amplitude 1 divided by 2 times epsilon is going to become infin infinitely large. It is, it is in this spirit that you can define and imagine that the Dirac delta function is the limit for epsilon that goes to zero of this rectangle function that I introduced. And obviously, because the limit process does not really change the relationship between the height and the base of that triangle, the area below the delta Dirac function, or the integral between minus infinity to plus infinity, is still one, it doesn't change. And I took the freedom to adopt the same graphical notation for the Dirac, Dirac delta centered in zero. 
There is another way to define the Dirac delta function, which might be apparently be regarded by some of you as very complicated. So it's a limit with a parameter epsilon that goes to zero like we did before of something else, something apparently complicated. But perhaps you are familiar with the bell-shaped function, or the Gaussian, or the function that uh, underlies the Gaussian distribution in statistics. This is precisely the same thing, where in this case it would be corresponding to a statistical Gaussian distribution with zero mean and variance epsilon square. And as you make the variance uh, getting smaller and smaller and smaller, the peak amplitude of this bell-shaped function is increasing and at some point it will reach an infinite value. And you see from this animation that this is also approximating a Dirac delta function everywhere else zero with the exception of the origin, the point where x equals to zero, where the function takes infinite values. Obviously, also in this case, the area below the function is equal to 1, which is probably something you learn in statistics or probability theory, saying that there is a normalization that makes the sum of all probabilities equals to 1, to 100%. So, for any value of epsilon, the area below a Gaussian function is equal to 1. So this is also the case for epsilon being infinitesimal. I hope that you're not particularly annoyed or distracted by the fact that, say, defining another function like Dirac delta of t minus t0 is equivalent to say that the Dirac delta has been shifted towards the right. Being t0 positive, this is fitting with what you learn in the previous series of videos. Adding a constant inside a function corresponds to a rigid shift towards the right. And once more, the integral between minus infinity to plus infinity of this function is still being 1. What I'd like to think in this case is that the Dirac delta was taking infinite values whenever the argument was 0. So in this case, the argument is 0 when t equals t0. And I see this as a kind of centering of the Dirac delta at the point t0 that I specify by this value uh, placed inside. These are all equivalent ways to describe a rigid shift. Let me conclude by listing some properties of Dirac delta functions. We already seen that its area is 1, and yes, changing the name of the variable does not really change the substance of this function. The same occurs for rigid translation for any value t0 positive or negative, provided that the uh, interval of integration is uh, enclosing the value t0. Let me make an example for this. Say that I have a function delta of t plus 32. What would be the area of this function in the range 0, 100. So this Dirac delta function is centered in the way, in the approximate intuitive way that I tried to convey in the previous slide. It is centered at the point t equals minus, minus 32. And here the range of integration is uh, towards its right from 0 to 100. So it does not include the point t equals minus 32 where the function goes to infinity. So this integral is 0. And the function is, by definition, is symmetric with respect to the vertical axis, so that delta of minus x is equivalent to delta of x, or delta of t minus t0 is equivalent to, all, to delta of t0 minus t. Finally, because of this property of being 0 everywhere with the exception of one point, if you take this Dirac delta function and you multiply by any other function, below the symbol of an integral, where the integration interval indeed spans a range that includes the point where Dirac delta is located, you have the interesting property that the integral is equivalent to the only value of the function g, this arbitrary function that you want to multiply below the sign of integral, that survives the 
embrace with this delta function. This embrace is uh, killing everywhere this function g because delta is zero everywhere, with the exception of x equal to zero. Now, because this takes an infinite value, the integral is still finite, it's not zero or infinite, and it takes the value of the function g computed in the point where the Dirac delta is centered. By extension, if the Dirac delta function is centered in another point, say x equals x0, where then this integral of the product makes surviving only the value of the function g corresponding to the, to the point where the Dirac delta is centered. In this last slide, I use interchangeably for this definition two different names of the independent variable, t or x. And I was careful, obviously, in the case of the integral, to make uh, explicit in the notation the integration variable consistent with the other variables. So please don't get confused when I change the name of variables, because it would be as if I changed the names of uh, things. Provided that we are still knowing what we are talking about, names are purely conventional.